let's take a moment. Let's welcome everybody, our online audience, all of our locations. So glad you are with us, tuning in. My name is Joey. I'm the lead pastor here at the Block Church, and uh, just thrilled that you're with us today. And uh, one quick thing before we dive into the message. Next week, we begin a theme month. So it's not a series. We do this in February. We call it Sit With Me. And on your seats is an invite. I want everybody to grab that invite. It's a ticket. You'll get these on your seats uh, all month long. And I want you to grab that. February, just so you know the why behind the what, it is our strong focus on evangelism, on reaching people, on inviting new people. I want to encourage you, invite somebody to church all month long. I'll be preaching next week. The whole month of February, it's, it's very focused on evangelism, outreach. We're going to be doing outreaches, reaching people. We need to participate and be a part of that. Okay, I want to encourage you, bring people with you. I'll be preaching next week. It's going to be so fun. First time all of our locations are meeting in the morning at the same time. So Center City uh, is not having night services, man. Meet people, go at night, get, go to a Super Bowl party, house party, whatever. Connect with people. Uh, there'll be prizes. I'm wearing a sweet new Randall Cunningham jersey next week. Okay, I'm already planning on my jersey. Wear a jersey. Let's have a lot of fun, a lot of giveaways. All month long is going to be really special. And then in March, we will dive into a, a more Lent-focused time of fasting and prayer. So February, man, let's reach people. You got that? If you do, say yes. Yeah. All right. All right, so uh, let's dive in on the final week of our series, Influence. And uh, I'm going to teach a message today uh, called Misunderstood. That's the title of my message, Misunderstood. Anybody misunderstood in their life? Okay, and uh, I, I want to teach around that, and uh, I want to kind of give us the theme of what influence is, okay? What we're focusing on, our word of the year. We don't worship our word of the year. We just use it as a focus, okay? And our word is this, the powerful effect on atmosphere, people, and culture. Regardless of our status... We must recognize our influence and leverage it to make the most of our lives. Most importantly, somebody say that, most importantly. Most importantly. We use it to partner with the Holy Spirit in making many disciples of Jesus. That is what this year is about. That's what we're focusing on, reaching people, uh, influencing people, influencing our neighbors, our friends, our family. That's the focus of this year. And uh, I want to I wanna talk about being misunderstood today for a moment because I think a lot of times I'm misunderstood. Sometimes my passion uh, can get misunderstood. Um, I, uh, I'm one of those people that can be a little bit abrasive, and I'm working on it, okay? Uh, but uh, I, uh, I, I'm one of those people that you kind of either love me or maybe you just don't like me very much. I don't have a lot of people who are in the middle with me, like, oh, I don't know how I feel about Joey. Uh, most of the people I know really like me or they really don't like me. Secretly, I like it that way, but I'm working on it because I know that's my flesh, okay? Uh, but I remember when I first met my wife, I moved up to this small town in New York, and uh, that's where she was from, it, it, this, this area called Elmira. Have you heard of Elmira? Anybody? Okay, and, uh, and so it's this, this small upstate New York town, and uh, I was there uh, to help the pastor, who was her father, reach more people. He, he wanted to transition his church, and so I was helping him reach young people, and I was urgent on my mission. I'm like, man, we got to paint the walls black, we got to add lights, we got to do series, we got to teach people stuff, we got to, man, we got to invite cards, we need to add five services, you know, I was like, I was going for it, and I was like 24, whatever, and so, uh, again, I understand I'm abrasive now, but can you imagine me even more immature back then, okay? And, uh, and so I, I was intense, but my, my hope and my passion, my, my intention was to reach people. But I was a little bit misunderstood. And I wasn't always smart in how I presented myself. In fact, I was so frustrated with the people, instead of calling the town Elmira, I used to call it Hellmira. <laughs> and... Uh, it, and so that didn't, the people didn't like that, but I was like, man, I'm like, we need to get with the program, people. Like, people are dying, and they don't know Jesus. It, it was even to the point where I was, I was so intense uh, th that Lauren's family didn't fully understand me and was weary about me taking Lauren with him. Can you even imagine that? <laughs> Crazy people. But when I was misunderstood, it, it was my passion, it was my urgency that was misunderstood. 
And I really believe that the church today and the mission of the church is extremely misunderstood. It is. It's misunderstood for a few reasons. There are some people who are so zealous and ridiculous that have created such a pain and a bad name on Christianity, and so then Christianity has become misunderstood. Uh, There's also a group of people who are so passive and don't really believe the scriptures that then people also misunderstand Christianity. And so we, we have these two extremes where there's passive people and then there's painful people. And there's some folks in the middle, you know, there's some folks living it right, but I'm afraid, and I want to put everybody in a box, but I'm afraid we've gone to the point where we've missed the purpose of the mission. We've missed the fact that we are called and meant to be influential people of God everywhere we go, everything we do. We are supposed to be on mission, and everybody's got to understand that. And so my goal today is really to help you get back on mission. If you've veered off course, if you've forgotten why you're a believer, if you've forgotten what Christianity is all about, let's get back on mission today. And if you are here seeking and wondering about Christianity, I'm going to break it down for you today. Uh, And and the next month is going to be really good for you as well, but I want to help you understand why we're here, why we're doing what we're doing. So I want to ask you a few questions today. I'm not going to preach a typical message where I walk through the scriptures verse by verse or walk through a text. I want to ask you some questions today. So I want you to lean in. I need to be careful and gentle today because I'm going to hit some topics and some subjects that could be a little bit, mm, might, just, ooh, might just rub you the wrong way. But I got to teach the scriptures and I got to get you on mission. I got to do my part and I got to let God deal with the repercussions. You understand? So I love you with all my heart. With all my heart, I love you. And I don't want you to misunderstand my urgency. I am urgent in wanting to reach people. I'm not just trying to grow to grow. I'm not just trying to expand to be rich and famous and influential and all the things. Trust me, the stress and the work of this ain't worth it. Okay, you can't pay me enough for the hours of emotion and passion we put into this thing. And I don't do this for anything other. I want to see my city come to Jesus. I want to see my city revived. I want to see people transformed. I want to see us be all that we're meant to be. I want the purpose of what this city was supposed to be about to come back to life. That's what I want. That's my hope. That's my dream. And I want you to get on mission with me. So here's a few questions. Here's the first one. If you're a Christian, what did Jesus ask you to do? It's simple, right? If you're a Christian, what do he ask you to do? There's, a, there's several things, right? I mean, we could go down the list. He says, repent, follow me, rejoice, honor your parents. Come on, somebody. I care about that passage now. <laughs> and all the parents said, yes and amen, all his promises. <laughs> uh, go the second mile. Love your enemies, lay up treasures in heaven, forgive, care for the poor, ask, seek, knock. There is a plethora of things that Jesus uh, recommends, suggests, commands, asks. There's a bunch of things, right? And it kind of makes me think of my parents who, growing up, uh, they would always bug me about little things that I didn't think mattered. Like, for instance, hey, Joey, you got to keep your car cleaned and you got to get the oil changed regularly. Like, because if you do the little things consistently, uh, you will, it, will, it will amount to health long term, right? Like, you, like, you clean your house, you know, if you just do a little bit every day, if we just do a little bit of laundry every couple of day, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a world of difference because when it all piles up, then it feels overwhelming. So, you know, my parents, they would bug me about stuff that would be annoying, but at the same time, like it was good. There was a greater purpose for it. And here's what I want you to understand. Jesus didn't just save us for a better life. He saved us for a life of purpose. And these little things that sometimes can feel daunting, but hey, care for your neighbor. Love your enemies. Be, do unto others as, as you would have them do unto you. These things that Jesus suggested, they're for a greater purpose. You understand? It's not just for you to have a better life. There's a greater purpose. There's an overarching mission. All of these things, us doing these things well, they point back to the whole purpose. 
right? He didn't just save us for a better life. Jesus didn't just save us to, to have good things go on. He didn't just save us so that our car would work and so that people would like us. On the contrary, here is our purpose. You want to know your purpose for life? Some of you wondering what your purpose for life is. I'm, I'm going to break it down for you right now. You never have to doubt ever again. Okay, it's right here. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. I'm going to use the message version. I rarely do, but I love the way it says it. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light. Bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. Jesus is going, if I make you light bearers, you, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? It's like that hide you under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. Okay, I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. I love this. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, I'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So, so all the things that you do, your workplace, the sports that you play, the games that you watch, the lives that you live, the kids that you have, it's for an overarching greater purpose. We are here to make disciples and to let our light shine. We're here to let people know God is open for business. My house is open. My life is open. I go, on, I go to work in the morning on mission, not to collect a paycheck, but to shine my light. I go to school on mission, not just to get through school to get to college, not just to get a scholarship. I'm there to reach my friends for Jesus. I'm there to be a light. I'm there to expose and illuminate the light colors of God into this world. And I think we've been misunderstood. I think we've forgotten it. I think we've gone about our, our, our we, we have compartmentalized our Christianity. And can I tell you, that's not what Jesus asked us to do. Everything we do, it points back to this mission. Everything. I am caring for the poor. Why? Because I am shining the light. You understand? I, I, am, I am loving my neighbor because I'm shining the light. I'm doing un, unto others because I'm shining the light. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm giving because I'm shining the light. All the things, man, it comes back to this main purpose. And our overarching purpose as Christians is to love God and influence others to know him. We are disciples who make other disciples. I know this isn't like a, a sexy message that's like got you all like, oh man, I got to change my life. God's going to make me rich today. All that thing. No, this is probably one of those. I just saw a bird box yesterday. Anybody see that? I'm proposing this, but she was like, she's like looking at the kids. She's like, this is probably going to be the longest journey of your life. You got to pay attention to everything I say. It's going to take forever. It's go you're going to hate it. A part of me feels like I should have opened up the message saying, this might be the longest, most painful sermon of your life. It's going to take, man, it's going to feel like forever. You're going to want to go to the bathroom and eat and hate me after it. But I'm telling you, when we get there, it's going to be God's glory on the other side. We make disciples at home with our kids to follow Jesus. We pray together. We do devos together. It is not in vain putting your kids to bed, to bed at night, going through the scriptures together, praying over them, speaking life over them. I, I'm trying to. My kid doesn't have a lot of a, attention span right now. He's young. I don't have much hope that he'll have a lot of an attention span based on my own self. But I mean, I look him in the eyes and say, you're going to be an influencer. You're going to be a man of God. You are anointed. You're called. You're going to reach people. You are a leader. I believe in you. I speak life over you, right? I'm speaking this. I'm discipling my kid right now, right? Right? I, like my home, I am shepherding my home. And everywhere I go, my, when I walk into a coffee shop, my, I'm the pastor of this coffee shop. And, and I'm there, and if I see a need, I want to meet the needs. Sometimes when I'm at restaurants and I see police officers or firemen, I feel compelled to pay for their lunches, right? Or, or when I see somebody struggling, I'm on mission. I am illuminating God colors and God light into the world because my mind, my brain, my heart, I'm on mission everywhere I go, everything I do. 
I am not compartmentalizing my Christianity. It is who I am. That is my identity. I'm a Christian before I'm a husband. I'm a Christian before I'm a father. I'm a Christian before I am a this or a that. I'm a Christian way before anything else. I am a believer, a Christ father, and all the other things that I do, it's because of that and it's from that. And I obey God because I love him, because he loves me. In fact, we obey because we are loved and because we love Ultimately, because there are consequences when we don't. There are. What are the consequences? That's the second question. What are the consequences when Christians aren't on mission? This is where the message turns to where it's a little bit uh, irritating to your flesh. What are the consequences when Christians aren't on mission? I want to give you, there's several, but I want to give you just two. Okay, here's the first one. Okay, the world is changing, okay? And so is the climate of Christianity in America. I'm reading this book right now uh, called uh, Canoeing the Mountains, and it's about the Lewis and Clark expedition. And uh, just a little history lesson, okay, because that's why you came to church. Uh, I love history. It was the only subject I did well at in school. And English, because I could notice all the grammar errors. But anyway, you don't need to know that. I just want to let you know that I'm good at grammar. I'm a linguist, okay? I have a book coming. No, I'm just kidding. All right, stop. So uh, I love the Lewis and Clark expedition because th- the concept of it is, is uh, they are trying to go west and pave the path for America, and this would open up the trade routes uh, so that uh, we would basically own the West. It's this manifest destiny. It's this idea uh, that America is ours. Now, I'm not trying to get into some sort of uh, discussion about morals. I'm just I- explaining the principle of their, of their mission, okay? And so they thought, and everybody thought, okay, the river, whether it was the Missouri River or, or, the, or the Mississippi River, I can't remember, but this river was, was going to connect them to the West. Well, when they started to move West, they realized there wasn't a river, there were mountains, <laughs> It, it, it's not, it wasn't this stream where they could row, row, row their boats, okay, like, like bird box, okay. It was, it was the Rocky Mountains. And so the terrain was different than what they knew and expected on the middle and on the east of the country. And, and it's powerful because the, the book is explaining that sometimes you've got to get rid of the canoes and you've got you to gotta, you gotta start to climb. And and the idea that they're saying is that the world that we live in is no longer the same world that we grew up in. Uh, The the, the church that you and I went to or knew about uh, when we were kids or our parents or our grandparents' church, it is not that church today. The nation we live in, it is totally, completely different. And so what he's illuminating is while many people say that we live in a Christian nation, we no longer live in a Christian nation particularly on the East Coast, in the Northeast, or the Mid-Atlantic, that Christianity is really, it's, it's, it's a thought, it's an idea, but it's not a lifestyle. And one of the consequences of Christians not living on mission is that the church as we know it is fading. People are coming to church less and less. Now I'm preaching to the choir because you're here today. Thank you for being here. I think people have thought that spirituality can be lived without being on mission. And so what people are doing is they're worshiping nothing because they're not attached to a mission. Uh, People have traded in the kingdom of God and the purpose of the church for being at home where it's convenient and comfortable. Can I tell you that there was nothing convenient and comfortable about the original church? This wasn't. Now, I'm not trying to scare you and say that everything we do is going to be uncomfortable besides the chairs you might sit in. Okay, we, we make it pretty easy. We even have valet parking and parking lots. But the idea is, is people, people in a lot of ways have gotten accustomed to convenience over mission. And also have been disenchanted by the people in the church who are so crazy and haven't shown what it means to be a Christ follower. So when Christians aren't on mission and we become complacent and not urgent about the mission, it is no longer attractive. People are giving through their church less and less. Nonprofit giving is up, but giving to a church is down. 
People have forgotten that there is no greater investment than in the kingdom of God. And, uh, and some of it is not people's fault because churches have mishandled resources. And so no wonder people are going, I'm not get- I can't give, th- I don't trust them because I'm not really giving to God. I'm giving to man to blow the money. So I get it. I'm not mad at people. I get it. What I'm telling you is, is we're still missing the mission. We're doing more together than we are apart. All right, I mean, there, there, there are 1,500, 1,500 pastors, listen to me, who leave the ministry every single month. 1,500. I didn't even know there was 1,500 churches, okay? Like, do you understand what I'm saying? That, that something is amiss. Denominations are dying. The church as a whole is dying. Now, can I tell you something? In this church, if we were to add a certain amount of people, not many, 50 to 100 people over the next month, did you know that we would be, and I'm not saying this to brag, I just want to give you context that God's at work. We would be considered one of the fastest growing churches in America right now. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that. To, what I'm saying is, is we are on mission. I'm proud of you. We need to keep being on mission because the consequences is the church, as we know it, will dissipate. Now, now I'm, look, I'm not, the, the church will be established. The gates of hell will not prevail, right? I know Jesus is going to win. Are you going to be a part of it? Are your neighbors going to be reached? Are the people in your life going to know God? I know I'm not preaching to you today. I'm more leading you today. But I'm trying to help you understand why you're a part of this church, why we are urgent about launching locations and reaching people, why we don't sit in church for two hours, right, why we have invite cards, why we give, why we do this, because we want to reach people. And if you don't self-feed, if you don't get in your Bible during the week or get in a block group during the week, you're going to go, oh, the church is not feeding me. No, what I'm doing is I'm teaching you how to cut open your meat and put it in your mouth. It's up to you if you're going to cut the steak. Because every time I open this thing, I'm convicted. But you got to open it. I'm worried about the church as a whole. Now, I want to say something. Listen to me. Look at me. I don't have much more to go. But I'm open and willing to change all of our methods. I'm married to the mission. I am dating our methods. So today, the lights, the sound, the music, the style, I'll change it tomorrow if it means reaching more people. And what happens and what's happened in the church is people got married to methods and forgot about the mission. They cheated on the mission. And they, and they, and they became adulterers to the methods. And then the church has experienced the consequence of that. I'm not preaching to somebody today. And when we're reading, you should have no other gods before me. What people have done is they've worshipped methods and ideologies instead of the mission that Jesus called it. We worship Jesus and because we love him. We are compelled to do the mission, to reach people. The world in front of us, it's like nothing like the world behind us. Sadly, listen to this, if we aren't on mission, we will only last on maintenance for so long. I want to I give you the second consequence. Okay, here's the second consequence here. Uh, second consequence is, excuse me for a moment, uh, is, is the idea that um, there is no punishment or life after death. And, and I want to I read what C.S. Lewis, who's an incredible theologian and, uh, men, you know, it just, I mean, just a phenomenal writer, all the things. He said this, he says, there's no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, hell, if it lay in my power. Now, I, I want to slow down for a moment. You've got to be mature today. You, you've got you to lean in because I'm not hooting and hollering. But you understand, the way that C.S. Lewis is presenting this, it's with a great deal of trepidation, gentleness, love. He's not bragging about the fact uh, that I'm a Christian, you're not, life sucks, you're going to hell. He's not doing any of that. What, what C.S. Lewis is saying is, man, I wish that I could change this thing. This is burdening me. This is hurting me. And, and, and the problem is, li- listen to me, the conversation about hell has been vastly ignored due 
to fear of making people uncomfortable, and the consequence has been that the church is no longer urgent with its mission. I want to address eternity for a moment, and I want to do this gently and lovingly. Please lean in. Please hear me. According to the Gospel Coalition, Jesus speaks about hell more than he does about heaven. Why? Because hell shows us the extent of God's love in saving us. Now, now why? Why did Jesus speak about hell uh, more than anyone else in the Bible? Because he wanted us to see what he was going to endure on the cross on our behalf. Here's what I mean. Okay, here's what a picture of hell is. I want to give you a picture of it. It's Matthew 27, 46. This is Jesus on the, clock, on the cross. About 3 o'clock, Jesus calls out in a loud voice. And he says this. He says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Essentially, what's happening in this moment, listen to me, is Jesus has all of our sin on his shoulders. In this moment, and is separated from his Father, from God. Now, now I want you to look at me for a moment. Okay, look at me for a moment. On the cross... Jesus takes all of our sin, all of our shame. That's why he came, to take it. Now, in this moment, what happens is because there's sin, he is then separated from God for a moment. Even though he is God, he's separated from his Father. And what's powerful about that, it is an illustration saying, I came here to carry all your sin so that you don't have to be separated. I came here so that no one, for whoever believes in me will not perish, will not die, but will have everlasting life. Just like with the thief on the cross, you can be the worst of the worst. But in the final moment, in a moment, you can say, hey, I believe. And the Bible says that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right? So, so the point is, is Jesus came and he died for all and, it's, and, and, and salvation is available for all. But, but, but let me be clear about something. Listen to me. And I don't want to debate what hell is or what isn't. There's a lot of theories. There's a lot of ideas. Here's what I'm saying. There is some element of life after death. There is some element when we don't know Jesus. Listen to me, please. With all sincerity and love in my heart. Without Jesus, there is some form of separation from God after we live. And so with that in mind, the church, we've got to be urgent. We've got to be passionate. We've got to be broken for people who don't know Jesus. This is why we do what we do. This is what I mean when I'm saying we are reviving our city. We're not just here to do good works. We're here to do kingdom work. And I don't know what you believe about all of this, and I encourage you, if you've got questions, ask us, and you want to talk to your block group leader, you want to send me an email, do it. Let's have a conversation, but I'm trying to illuminate. We're not just here to have a holy huddle. We're here. We're here because we got to run the play. And the play is, is we've got to see people come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we do believe that their life will get better when Jesus is involved. It won't get easier, but it will get better. And you are proof of that. You know that there's no better life or no greater life you would rather live than life with Christ. See, Jesus didn't just save us from a purposeless life. He saved us from a hopeless eternity. He saved us from a hopeless eternity. I want to read John 14, 6. And the Bible says this. It's Jesus talking. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. Everybody say that. No one. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, so listen, look at this. Listen. It's not good people who go to heaven. It's saved people. If you're here today and you're, you're saying, I, I live a good life. I just, I want to be clear with you, according to the scriptures and the power of God that's at work in our life, that knowledge and the understand, understand that we know about Jesus, it's, it's not good enough to be good enough, because we can't be good enough. Our righteousness is like filthy rags, nothing good in me, it's only Christ in me, that's it. And so unless, unless I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, 
See, I don't have to strive anymore. That's the law. I'm not saying I take grace for granted, right? But I, I'm just saying, man, all I've got to do is get on my knees and say, I'm, I'm not good enough. God, would you be the good in me? And that's, that's, that's all it is. That's all it is. I wanted to gently walk through this because I know this is touchy stuff. But I just, you, you, you can't misunderstand the mission of the church. This is, why they, this is why they gathered. This is why they set up. This is why we have community, to grow, to be a disciple. Yes, it's important that we grow in our faith, and it's important that we have better marriages, and it's important that, we, that, we're, that we're people of integrity and character. The, the whole pro, it all points back to showing the God colors on the earth to reach people. Look, somebody who doesn't know Jesus is somebody's son or daughter. Somebody in your workplace who doesn't know Jesus is somebody's father or mother. Somebody in your life is somebody's sister or brother. Somebody is somebody's best friend, teammate, family member. Somebody in your life, you're 12 to 20 people that are not connected to God. His local church, there's somebody. What are we doing about it? Are you fasting? Are you praying? Are you weeping? Are you broken? Where is our brokenness and urgency for people who don't know Jesus? And I just believe, I speak this in faith. I prophesy this. I believe this is here. Kids are coming home. I believe that lost children we've been praying for, if we commit to praying for them and fasting for them, I believe this is the year of the turn. I believe this is a year where kids are getting saved. That families are coming back. I believe this. I'm praying for this. This is my prayer. This is our influence. And look, you can come to this church and disagree. And I'm good with that. Because the church has always been full of people who have disagreed. Let's, let's ride that out together. Let's not live in the culture that says, oh, you don't agree with me 100%. I'm offended at you and I can't be a part of your life. That's the disease of our culture, offense. We worship offense in our culture. So if you disagree with me, okay, let's, I can't tell you how many great conversations I have with people who disagree with me. And we're closer and we're better because of it. I'd tell you a great story if I had time, but I don't. Because I got to go reach more people somewhere else. I'm going to ask you a question as we conclude. What part can you play in all of this? What part can you play in all of this? I love what the Bible says, Matthew 9, 38. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the field. I want to highlight the fact that Jesus is in charge of the harvest and, and he grows. And if we labor without his blessing, we labor, we work in vain. So without prayer, without covering this thing, without being obedient to God, it, 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 we're wasting our time. Right, but we're praying. We, we need to be praying for more people to start churches in Philadelphia, uh, across the nation. We need to be praying for churches who need to be revitalized, who've lived their day, because there is a time and place where churches live their day and they need to move on and hand it over to other people and merge, being honest. Uh, we need to pray uh, that, that God sends seasoned believers to help us work the fields, and we need to pray for it yourself. That God would compel you to be a soul winner. But we, we need to pray, but we can't just be uh, we can't just be prayer warriors. We've got to be prayer workers. We've got to work it too. We've got to write names of people down. We, we've got to we, we've got to pray for friends consistently, consistently, consistently. The Bible says this. I already said what the Bible says. Let me conclude with this. We must be influential how and now. We must be influential how and now. Paul says this, he says, be seasoned. That's how we're influential. We, 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 we've got to be seasoned. He says in Colossians that every conversation should be seasoned, Holy Spirit enabled. In other words, when you get up in the morning, I'm encouraging you, wake up and say, God, use my tongue today. Not to speak death, but to speak life. God, help me in every conversation I have to point back to you. We've got to be filled. Right? So we've got to be seasoned. We've got to be filled. Did you know that the Holy Spirit has come to give you power? To be his witness. And so every day we've got to say, Holy Spirit, fill me up. 
I'm praying for so-and-so. Holy Spirit, guide me. Guide my language. Guide my mind. Guide my thoughts. Guide my ideas. Guide where I go. Guide what I say. While I'm driving, speak to me. While I'm caring, speak to me. While I'm walking, speak. Every moment, Holy Spirit, you can have a resonance in my life. I'm listening. We've, we've got to be seasoned. We've got to be filled. And we've got to be intentional. We've got to write names down. We've got to give cards out. We've got to drop cards at places. Right? We've got we've to be thinking about people. We've got to be investing in relationships. And some relationships take time. An invite to church isn't going to get it done. Some relationships mean that you've got to, over time, hey, I care about you. What do you need? Sometimes we've got to meet needs before they ever see that they are in need. We've got to care for people. Love people. And, and at the end of the day, our love is because we were first loved. So, so we've got to be seasoned, we've got to be filled, we've got to be intentional, and then we've got to be normal. Come on, somebody. You know, the, bigger, the biggest hindrance to lost souls is weird saved souls. Stop being weird, stop being annoying, stop being obnoxious online. Come on, somebody. Stop arguing and fighting with people online and putting your scripture verses because they don't care. Please, for the love of God, this is why people misunderstand Christians because of weird, obnoxious Christians. We lead with love, not with hate. We lead with love, not with letters. We we lead with love. Your arguments online have rarely ever or never changed anybody's opinion. I stop subtweeting, sub messaging, sub posting. It's so annoying and it's ungodly and it's sin. And if that's all you heard today, that would be enough. Be normal. Here's the last one be accountable. Who in your life is encouraging you? Who in your life is holding hands with you? Who in your life is praying for your mom with you? Who in your life is praying for your sons and daughters with you? Who who in your life is keeping you accountable on the things you've committed to, to be influential? Who, what group are you in? What team are you on? Who's who's checking in with you and saying, hey, I missed you at church for the past three weeks and you're not being offended? That's a sign of care. Care. Who, who, who are you influencing? Who are you being a grandpa and a grandma to? Who are you being a, a father and a mother to? A big brother and a big sister? Who are you accountable to? Who? You've got to dive into relationships in 2019. I love you, church. Listen to me. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I believe in you. And if I've rubbed you the wrong way today, it actually wasn't me. It was the God that you say you love. Don't blame me, blame the scriptures. I know right now there is a tension in some of your souls, but you're going, oh no, how could I face the idea of eternity without a loved one? Good, that's the tension you must feel. But guess what? God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. And he hears your prayers. And I I can't, again, I can't get into the whys of life and all the things today, that's what groups are for and conversations are for. But listen to me, we've got to be on mission. Are you on mission today? I'm believing for your family. I pray for you. I pray for your family. I pray for your kids. I pray for your loved ones. I pray for them. I've got them too. And I'm believing for the greatest move of God in history. And, and the last thing I'll say, because I know I'm way over, but in the early church, it was so pre-Christian, not post-Christian. It, 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 it was so foreign, the idea of Christianity. And so the church was persecuted and in pain, but they never wavered. And it was in their pain, it was in their persecution, it was in the press that God did not abandon. In fact, He did it. And the church spread like a wildfire in the season where it seemed like the darkness was at the greatest. And in our nation, in our world, it it seems like, it feels like it might be more dark than it is light. But can I tell you that's good news? That's when God shows up. That's when the light comes through. 
I think we're on the precipice of the greatest season the church has ever experienced. But are you on mission? I'm ready to revive this city by any means necessary. Can you stand to your feet?